Thank you, everybody, for coming here through the snow and the late nights and lots of drinking. Um, and what I would like to do today is to follow up on some of the other talks that we've heard. And that's a great point. You know, it's kind of annoying to go late in a conference, right? Because then you don't, you know, you can't relax the whole time. But the advantage is, is that you get to follow up on talks that already occurred. And the one that was most relevant uh, was Dan Bolnick's talk about sympatric speciation and stickleback, why not? And as he demonstrated in that talk, you have all of these mechanisms that you would think would drive sympatric speciation, and yet there doesn't seem to be much, if any, progress toward it in stickleback. So what I'm going to ask then is, what happens when you add a little bit of space into these mechanisms of divergent selection and potential assortative mating? If you add a little bit of space in, you get more progress toward ecological speciation. Now, I'm not going to try to argue that there's a whole bunch of new species of stickleback. So this why yes really is, you know, why yes and no and partly. And so what I'll do is I'll try and illustrate how you can use a system like this, a parallel evolution situation, to be able to examine the factors that influence progress toward ecological speciation. I think that like the, the last slide that you do in your talks normally is like the introduction slide. It's like, here's the background, here's why speciation is important, here's what parapatry is, here's what ecological speciation is. And so I had this blank slide set up for that in preparation saying, okay, on the last day I'll make that introductory slide. But uh, of course you don't need that introductory slide. You guys know what, know what uh, all that stuff is. So <laughs> there's my introduction and background to the problem. Suffice it to say that what I want to do is I want to try and use a parapatric system to examine these factors that do promote and constrain progress toward ecological speciation. And so let's go then um, from that brief introduction into the specific system that I want to talk about, and that is lake and stream stickleback. So I want to do a couple things to introduce you to this system and show you how we can use it to study these factors. And the first is go through uh, one particular study system in some detail, and that's the Misty Lake system, and talk to you first about what is most likely uh, adaptive phenotypic variation. Just briefly mention the genetic basis for that differentiation to the extent that we understand it and then investigate the potential for certain reproductive barriers that we would think would be important in ecological speciation within stickleback and in general. And then use the uh, power of evolutionary replication that's provided by uh, independent lake stream pairs to answer questions such as can we look more explicitly at the role of divergent selection in its different strengths in driving ecological speciation and the role of dispersal or gene flow, and then try to infer the joint influences of divergent selection and dispersal and gene flow in driving diversification and constraining diversification at the same time. So of course Dan gave you the introduction to stickleback, and most of us know about stickleback anyway, so I don't have to go into details about that. Instead what I'll do is I'll just tell you more specifically about the lake stream contrast. And the one that, I, that is perhaps best studied is the misty lake contrast. And so uh, here's the lake here, it's a, quite a small lake, it's relatively shallow, it's only six meters deep, it's only about a kilometer across, and it has a small stream flowing out of it, so this is outlet stream, and a very small stream flowing into it as well. And so I'll start off by telling, talking about divergence between the lake and the stream, the inlet stream, and then later on in the talk, the outlet stream will become important. So of course the first thing we do when we want to quantify variation in a system and try and infer adaptation, we simply go out and measure everything in the population. And we say how do traits differ, traits that we think would be important in adaptation to lakes versus streams. And so here's just one representative, one representation of two important traits. And one of them is the same trait that Dan talked about, or one of the traits he talked about, and that's Gilraker number. Another extremely important trait is the shape of the body, in this case body depth standardized for a common body length. So here's a typical lake fish up here, here's a typical, don't you love it when people say typical, right? Because what they really mean is these are the ones that best illustrate the difference. But to my knowledge, actually, these were chosen somewhat randomly. Now, if you look at these traits, you see that uh, both of them, which are important for foraging and locomotion in stickleback and fishes in general, differ between the lake and the inlet. So here are a couple samples from the lake, a couple different years. Here's a couple different years and a couple different locations in the inlet stream. 
And what you see is that these traits differ in ways repeatedly and, and predictably and strongly in ways that we would expect to be adaptive. So you have more gill rakers in the lake where they tend to feed more often on zooplankton, and you have fewer gill rakers in the stream where they feed more often on larger benthic macroinvertebrates. In addition, uh, you have a large divergence in, in body shape, so the inlet fish are deeper bodied for a given length than are the lake fish. Now, this appears to be because the lake fish do a lot of constant swimming in the lake while searching for zooplankton, whereas the stream fish do a lot of time in complex environments, sort of looking for benthic macroinvertebrates. They don't sit up and swim in the middle of the current. So, of course, the next question then is once you have this morphological variation, and many morphological traits differ, the question is what's the genetic basis for that? So we started off doing all the traditional common garden experiments, which are, of course, still extremely useful. And we find that many of these differences do have a genetic basis. What I want to do here is just show you the more, most recent results that we haven't published yet, which are looking at line crosses, so hybrids and then back crosses to the parental forms, to get some hint as the to the additive dominance or epistatic contributions to these two traits. And so the different lines are for males and females. Here are the back crosses and the F1 and F2 hybrids. And you can see that for gill raker number, it's very strongly genetically based and it seems to have an almost entirely additive genetic basis. For body shape, and here you're looking at the first relative warp from geometric morphometrics, uh, you find that uh, you still have a very strong genetic basis to the traits, but in males, uh, sorry, females, there's a strong dominance component as well. So the lake alleles seem to be somewhat dominant over the stream alleles. But in the, in the males, you have almost perfect additivity again. This is all just by way of saying that most of the traits that we look at do have a genetic basis. We don't know the specific genes that are involved, of course, although hopefully we, we will soon. Now, the other thing is that if, if you want to try and infer fitness differences, uh, that's often obviously quite difficult. But what you can do is you can look at performance differences. So how does the morphology influence a performance difference that we would expect to be relevant to fitness in these environments? And so recently we've used these common garden fish to determine whether or not performance, aspects of swimming performance, are divergent among these populations. And so here you have inlet and lake fish uh, for males and females for a measure of sustained swimming, critical swimming speed. And what you see is that the lake fish are better sustained swimmers, which is what we expect from their morphology, and it's also what we expect given the way that they feed. And we can look at other swimming measures as well, such as burst swimming ability. So lake fish are also better burst swimmers. Now, this might seem surprising because you supposedly can't do good sustain and burst swimming at the same time, but they've decoupled these different mechanisms because they do sustain swimming with their pectoral fins, but burst swimming with their caudal fin. Interestingly, however, the uh, maneuverability, which is a measure of how quickly they can turn, is actually higher in the inlet fish, at least for males which is what we expect in complex environments. So you do seem to see genetic divergence, not just in traits, but in performance measures that should influence fitness in these different environments. Okay, so now we have a lot of divergence that appears to be adaptive in this population, and therefore we would expect by ecological speciation that you would see lots of reproductive barriers that are driven by these ecological and adaptive differences. And so when we look for these ecological barriers, or these ecologically driven reproductive barriers, we often start by looking at the amount of gene flow. So is there limited gene flow between the inlet and the lake? And so we've done a whole bunch of assays with mitochondrial DNA and microsatellite markers. And I'm just showing you a couple of results. And the main essence of it is that the inlet and lake fish exchange very few genes. So these are mitochondrial markers, two different major haplotypes. And here's a tree of uh, microsatellites with a very large difference between the inlet fish and the lake fish. And as a precursor to what I'll say later, you see the outlet fish are very similar to the lake fish. So you have a lot, you have almost no gene flow between the lake and the inlet, but there's a lot of gene flow between the lake and the outlet. Now, the problem with trying to infer whether or not this is ecologically driven reproductive isolation is that ecology is confounded here with geography. So not only are they in different ecological environments, but they are also in different places. So you can't be sure whether or not the, the reproductive barriers, or at least the things that are limiting gene flow, are ecologically driven. So one of the ways to get further insight into that is to basically create artificial sympatry. So you bring them together and ask, do you still see reproductive barriers that seem to be driven by these ecological differences when you remove that geographical separation between them. 
And so we've done a whole bunch of experiments along, along these lines. Though we might expect to see natural selection against migrants between the environments. You might have a sorted of mate choice. You could have uh, selection against hybrids. And you could also see habitat choice. That's the reason why you have limited gene flow. So I'll just give you one slide for each of these reproductive barriers, potential reproductive barriers. So to test for selection against migrants, we've done several experiments like this now. We've taken lake and inlet fish and put them in enclosures in lakes and in inlets. The idea being, of course, is that the inlet fish should do better in the inlet enclosures and the lake fish should do better in the lake enclosures. And the typical assay for this in stickleback is growth rate. So this experiment is a two-week growth rate experiment. And the question is, do you see local adaptation reflected in these growth differences? So uh, here's the change in mass over time adjusted for body size. And you can see that most of the fish actually lose weight. So these are not particularly benign environments for them, uh, perhaps because their densities are higher than you would see in nature. And here's the lake enclosures. And you see the lake fish lose less weight than do the inlet fish. So all seems well in respect to uh, the lake environment, where the lake fish are clearly doing better than the inlet fish, which would select, suggest selection against in, inlet fish if they went into the lake. And so uh, what we expect here then is that the inlet fish will be up here and the lake fish will be down here and you'll have nice crossing lines that reflect local adaptation by both populations. And of course, that's not what we found. So in this case, the lake fish also did better in the inlet with respect to growth, which is not at all what we expect and not what we see in typical uh, stickleback experiments using roughly similar methods. So it seems that if you think about natural selection against migrants, by this particular assay, you might have uh, asymmetric selection against migrants. They'd have a problem going one way, they wouldn't have a problem going the other way. Now, of course, you could do much better assays for this, longer times, survival, all kinds of things. But what we did here was we replicate those experiments you've seen for, say, benthic and limnetic stickleback, and we don't find the same thing. What about assortative mate choice? So here what we did was we did a common garden experiment, and we asked uh, females from the inlet and the lake whether they preferred to mate with inlet and lake males. And we did this using the same protocols that are used for Ben Think and Limnetic Stickleback. Mm -hmm. So you have mating probability here, and we expect the inlet females to like the inlet males, so a nice high red bar here and a low blue bar, and lake females would like lake males, so a high blue bar and a, and a low red bar. And this time, we did not find that either. So for example, inlet females actually seem to prefer, if anything, lake males. Although there's no statistically significant difference there, so we, at least we can say they don't have any preference. And the lake females actually seem to at least qualitatively prefer the inlet males. But once again, the least we can say is that there's no difference to common garden reared fish in what they prefer in terms of a mating partner. So there's no assortative mating in, in this system under these conditions. So here we have no, no evidence that divergent selection has led to positive assortative mating when you remove environmental influences by rearing them in a common garden environment. So what about uh, selection against hybrids then? So I showed you that hybrids are intermediate, at least in many of the characters. So maybe the hybrids have a disadvantage when it comes to mating or survival. So here are the mating results. And what you're looking at here is uh, analysis of a bunch of reproductive behaviors. Uh, these are the red uh, triangles here are inlet fish, the blue ones are lake fish, and the green ones are hybrids. This is once again in, the, in a common garden environment in the lab. The hybrids have roughly intermediate reproductive behavior, which would suggest that maybe they would have a problem with both inlet males, or sorry, inlet females and lake females. But what you can see is these are the successful males. And if you look at that, just blur your eyes, you'll see that there's more gray on top of the hybrid males than there is on top of the inlet or lake males. Hybrids did better, including in competition with pure types. So, you know, I said parapatric speciation and stickleback, why yes, but here we don't have any real evidence that, that any of these reproductive barriers we expect to arise are occurring in these systems. So, of course, what that does is that makes one keep looking for more reproductive barriers because they must be out there somewhere. And so um, we've done this as well and we continue to do this. Uh, and I want to say also that now we've found a hybrid zone, a very small hybrid zone in a marsh between the lake and the inlet. And in that hybrid zone, these black dots, the, the uh, fish are 
are intermediate. And so we can use this hybrid zone perhaps to get us more indication of, of selection in nature against hybrids if there is any. But I also wanted to mention one last habitat barrier. And uh, we looked at this a little bit, but Dan Bolnick did a much better job in another system, so I want to show you his results. So these are basically suggesting the potential for habitat choice to be a reproductive barrier in the Misty Lake system, uh, not the actual demonstration of that in the Misty Lake system. So what Dan did was he took 761 lake fish and 701 uh, stream fish, and he released them at the junction between the lake and the stream, and then went back uh, and saw who went where. And here are the results. This is the recapture location. In the lake, you had almost entirely lake fish, and in the stream, you had almost entirely stream fish. So if they have had prior experience with their home environments, and you put them at the junction between the two, they will return to the environment to which they are presumably locally adapted. So the results that we have for the MISTI system using only a one direction transplant suggest that this might also be important, but we don't have this full reciprocal uh, design. Okay, so where are we then? So in this one system, we thought we would see all of these reproductive barriers that have been found in stickleback, and we didn't find them, or at least we're, we're having difficulty finding them. So what this means then is that even in this one system that's so adaptively divergent, the reproductive barriers don't seem to be evolving in the way you might expect. So what that means is that we need to start thinking about this system as a way of trying to understand why certain reproductive barriers can evolve as a result of ecological differences and why other ones can't. And so that's what I want to do now, and I just want to introduce this idea of comparative studies. So this is something that Schooley showed earlier. You have progress toward ecological speciation along here. So you have different study systems that might fall in different places along this axis. Uh, Dan's lacustrine uh, three-spine stickleback fall over here. Continuous adaptive variation without any reproductive isolation. I guess I'm sticking the lake and stream fish in misty system here where you have some discontinuous adaptive variation but there's little reproductive isolation. And so what I want to do now is go and look at a bunch of other lake and stream pairs and ask do they fall at different places along this continuum and why? So that then is the potential of evolutionary replicates. And so we've seen a couple of talks of doing this sort of thing and we'll see some more. The snail talk was an example, of course, and uh, um, Felicity Jones will talk about uh, a whole bunch of uh, freshwater anadromous uh, pairs. And so the idea here, of course, is that you have a whole bunch of different lake stream pairs. These are just some of the ones we've studied. There's probably a hundred on Vancouver Island. And so we can go and quantify selection, gene flow, all these kind of things in these populations and see if we see signatures of progress toward ecological speciation. And this can work because first off, these do appear to be independent origins. Each one is a separate colonization of marine fish into fresh water. And this is just showing that basically this is a microsatellite tree, but it doesn't matter what you look at, you see the same result. These are all of the different samples in one of these uh, uh, surveys and the outlet sites, so st outlet stream sites are in green, lake sites are in blue, and uh, inlet sites are in red. And these are the different systems, the independent systems, and you can see that uh, in almost all cases, they cluster differently from each other, implying, if not independent origins, at least long history of evolutionary independence. FST values between systems are like 0.3. And in addition, this also shows you that within systems, you have a lot of variation in how much gene flow there is, for example. So you can look here and you can see that, you know, in the MISTI system, there's a pretty big difference between the inlet sites and the lake sites. But in the beaver system, there's very little difference. So there seems to be different amounts of reproductive isolation in the different systems, which can then maybe provide a substrate for disentangling these effects. There's also a lot of morphological there's variation in morphological divergence in these systems. Some systems show a lot of morphological divergence. This is the difference in Gilraker number between the lake and the stream. And this is body depth, so the same traits I showed you before. Some systems show very little divergence. Other systems show a lot of divergence. So this is the variation that we want to exploit to attempt to understand the various factors that are driving and influencing this divergence. So what are things to test then? So theoretical models, tell us that there are a lot of things that might be relevant here. Uh, two of the ones that, and we've done some of our own theory and uh, individual-based modeling to confirm that, that at least in the system that we're modeling, a parapatric system, you expect the same sorts of things. 
So you might expect that as divergent selection gets stronger, progress toward ecological speciation should be greater. You would also expect that as dispersal gets higher, progress toward ecological speciation might be less. There are many other things that are important here too, plasticity, sexual selection, um, whether traits are magic or not, or muggle. I like that, by the way. Can I publish that, please? Because that's so cool. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so basically the idea here is that if you have greater environmental contrast, that should lead to greater divergence selection, which should lead to greater adaptive divergence. That's the number one to test. Number two, of course, is that increasing dispersal should increase gene flow, which should constrain adaptive divergence. But as things become more adaptively divergent, they should exchange fewer genes, which is ecological speciation. So we can try and disentangle these two pathways and see what their relative contributions are to progress toward ecological speciation and adaptive divergence in general. So what's the role for divergent selection? So we went to a whole bunch of different sites and sampled the fish at these sites and looked at their diets as a proxy for the strength of divergent selection, which is the same thing that, that Dan does and other people do, of course. So the first thing is that there's lots of variation in apparent strength of divergent selection. What you're looking at here is, once again, this is basically, I mean, this is exact follow-up to the sorts of things that Dan measures. So you've got, in this case, proportion of limnetic prey. So that should reflect selection on both body shape and on gill rakers. And you see in some systems you have pretty large divergence. So the lake site, for instance, has a lot of limnetic prey, or a fair amount of it anyway, whereas the inlet site has very little. The stream site has very little. In other systems you see essentially that there's no real difference at all, or perhaps even the stream sites have more limnetic prey. So in these systems we would expect not much progress toward ecological speciation, but in these systems like the Pi system or the Robert system or the boot system, we would expect because there's strong divergence selection that you would have strong adaptive divergence and progress toward speciation. So here's the result is that that variation in divergence selection does correlate strongly with adaptive divergence. So here's the divergence along a principal component axis that involves a bunch of gill raker traits and a bunch of body depth measures. Now what you see is that in those systems where you have more divergence in limnetic prey and the proportion of limnetic prey in the diet, you have more divergence in the traits that are supposedly reflective of uh, adaptation to different diets. So that seems to make sense and it, there does seem that therefore to be evidence that as you get more divergent selection, you get more adaptive divergence which should then contribute to uh, reproductive isolation. Now, I just want to also point out this dot here, which is clearly off the regression line, and that's the MISTI outlet site. If you remember earlier, the MISTI outlet site shows almost no genetic divergence from the lake, as opposed to the MISTI inlet site. So this then is the second question. You know, has the high dispersal and, low, and high gene flow in this MISTI outlet site, is that a common phenomenon? Whereas you get more dispersal between sites, you get less adaptive divergence. So we tested that with a similar but not completely overlapping set of samples in a different study. And in that case, I just want to remind you that you do have lots of variation in the apparent amount of gene flow in these systems. And we know that's probably gene flow rather than time because to a first approximation, these have all diverged for a roughly similar amount of time. So does that variation in gene flow then correlate with variation in those traits that we think are important? So indeed it does. Here's the relationship between the difference in body depth and the amount of gene flow, which we would presume to be at least partly reflective of the amount of dispersal. And you see that as gene flow goes up, the amount of divergence goes down. Of course, you don't know whether gene flow is causing the reduced divergence in adaptive traits or whether increased divergence in adaptive traits is causing reduced gene flow. So cause and effect are not clear in this correlation. So what we did was we also included variation in the strength of divergence selection and this pattern still holds. So even if you control for apparent variation in the strength of divergence selection, gene flow seems to be constraining adaptation. Um, and as I've alluded to, gene flow also varies in the MISTI system. So you have uh, these lake and outlet samples that cluster very closely together and the inlet samples cluster very differently. So that's where those samples came from in the inlet stream, the lake and the outlet stream. But what we started doing is asking 
What if we start taking a look at more fine-scale variation within these systems? For instance, we sample in a clinal fashion moving out of the lake. And then we can ask, for instance, you know, do you see variation in adaptive divergence along this uh, climb? And the first thing to show you is that in the MISTI system, there's high gene flow from the lake into the outlet along the entire outlet. So here's a structure analysis, and the outlet sites cluster just like the lake, with the inlet sites being very different. So there's very high gene flow along the entire outlet. And this variation correlates with trait divergence. So here you have, uh, this is a discriminant function in this case of the same traits with distance from the lake. These are lake sites here, these are inlet sites. So you have a huge difference between the lake and the inlet and then very little divergence along the inlet except for here. But in the outlet site you have this clinal pattern of adaptation moving out of the lake, which suggests that there's really high gene flow here and perhaps uh, low divergence selection. And if you estimate what the optimum would be for these traits, you see that they get further and further constrained as they get further and further from the lake. Tantalizingly, they also decrease in abundance as you get further from the lake. So this, this distance here is the opposite of that distance there. So these are uh, catch per unit effort measures and as you see as they get worse and worse adapted, they have lower and lower population sizes. So maybe, and we think that this is the case, that there's such high gene flow far down in the system and there's such poor adaptation that they actually can't persist there. Okay, so the final thing that I want to do then is try and disentangle these effects to a greater extent by doing that clinal type of work, but in multiple systems. So each of those systems I showed you earlier, we can sample all the way from the lake and uh, along a climb going out the outlet stream. We can relate that to morphology, that's this axis here, and uh, uh, structure and diet. And we can ask, can we disentangle some of these effects? So here's the sites that we used for that particular survey, many of which are similar to the ones we did previously. And I maybe should point out that this is where all Dan's work is done here. We were working independently on the same lakes without knowing it for several years. Uh, so this is the one slide that I want to use to summarize that. Now these are eight different systems and it's telling you three things in this slide. One of them is a proxy for the strength of divergence selection and that's divergence in the amount of, uh, the, the amount of limnetic prey. This is the amount of adaptive divergence in the sense that this is a bunch of foraging related morphological traits. And then the different colors for the dots indicate different clusters in a structure analysis. And these are each different sites, one lake site and then a bunch of stream sites uh, indicated by L or S. So now just let me draw your attention to several of these different plots because you get very different results in the different ones. There are at least three of these systems where there's strong, very strong divergent selection. So you see the lake site and then you have a jump to the stream sites. So look at pi system here. This is the proportion of limnetic prey in this sample in pi lake and then this is where it is in the stream. In these three systems, coupled with this strong divergent selection, you have a big shift in adaptive divergence along the y-axis and two genetic clusters, often fairly close to the lake. So in these three systems, divergent selection has been strong and has seemingly driven fairly substantial progress toward e ecological speciation. Then you have three systems where you do not have strong divergent selection. Instead, lake and stream sites do not differ that much in uh, diet. And as a result, they do not differ much in morphology. And often, you either don't have two genetic clusters, I'll show, well, I shall show you another one in a minute, or only when you get really far from the lake do you have a second genetic cluster. So in these systems, divergent selection has not been strong enough to drive adaptive divergence and therefore substantial progress toward ecological speciation. This is the MISTI outlet system where you see that although there's divergent selection, there's no adaptive divergence and there's only one genetic cluster. So in this system, it seems that high dispersal, there's so much dispersal from the lake into the outlet stream that adaptation can't proceed and therefore there's no progress toward ecological speciation. You know, I was gonna try to categorize this one as well, but I just figured it was gonna be too complicated so we won't worry about it. It seems to be a mixture of these different effects. And oh, I also wanna mention that you also see a signature of gene flow even in these high divergent systems because stream sites that are close to the lake are more morphologically similar to lake fish. 
We're also doing these comparative climbs across continents now. This is work by Daniel Berner in Switzerland, who's a postdoc of mine, comparing divergence in, the, in, in uh, systems in British Columbia to divergence in systems in Switzerland. And I just want to give you a, a hint of what we see there. It's quite remarkable. This is divergence uh, along a habitat uh, canonical variant or discriminant function. And this is a continent discriminant function. This is what the shapes look like. With, uh, along those axes. These are the British Columbia systems, uh, five of them that are hi highly divergent, and those are the Swiss systems. So there's incredible difference in the amount of divergence in the British Columbia systems versus the Swiss systems. In addition, there's almost no genetic divergence between lake and stream sites here relative to here. So something is constraining progress here, and one of those things might be that these are recently colonized sites. So we're trying to do this comparative clinal work across systems as well. It's also being done by uh, Mark Rabinet on uh, systems in, uh, in Ireland. So I think it's a very powerful approach, this comparative approach in, coupled with clines, although we haven't done clines here. So in conclusion then, uh, I would suggest that these independent replicates uh, in similar ecological contrasts are a useful tool. I think that you've seen that that's a useful tool in many talks besides mine. Uh, in addition, you have progress toward ecological speciation that's highly variable among these replicate parapatric contexts. Sometimes it goes a long way, sometimes it doesn't go anywhere. And the two things that so far seem to explain that is that you have stronger divergence selection. When that's present, it's allowing greater progress. No surprise there, but it's a formal demonstration of that. In addition, when you have weaker dispersal, therefore lower gene flow, you also have greater progress toward ecological speciation. Remembering again that gene flow is also uh, has a feedback from adaptive divergence. So it's a feedback loop that's occurring there. So uh, I'm hoping that we can continue to apply this approach to investigate more factors that might determine progress toward ecological speciation in these lake and stream pairs of stickleback. Thank you. I, I just remembered that the other slide you always leave to the end is the acknowledgement slide. And now I've realized that I actually never even remember to do anything with the acknowledgement slide. So um, I, I apologize to all the people who I should be acknowledging. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so um, we're using, let me try and recapture the question, make sure I understand it. Um, we're using difference in diet as a proxy for divergent selection, but in principle, the divergent selection is really driven by difference in prey availability. Um, it's just much more easy to get diet because it's hard to say sample benthic invertebrates in the lake and somehow mix, mix that with the amount of zooplankton in the lake. Um, so it has turned out that uh, when you do do that, diet is a very good proxy for it. So you're absolutely correct that it's not a perfect measure for divergent selection, uh, but it does seem to reflect those aspects of divergent selection we would expect to be present. Uh, are you reviewing our grant proposals? <laughs> yeah. Yes, but I mean, if you think to like the, the Kirkpatrick and, and Barton um, range limit model, that's the same sort of thing that you see. And it's partly because you have high densities, higher densities toward the lake. So you have fewer outlet fish far from the outlet, and as a re so they feed back on each other. But partly as a result of that, the, and there's high gene flow along the entire outlet. So the proportional effect of the gene flow is greater when you get further from the lake. 
Okay. In, in addition, in addition, there is a climb in uh, environmental conditions as well uh, when you go further away from the lake. So not only is the effect of gene flow becoming proportionally greater, but the target that they're trying to hit is further and further away. My God, that is just a fantastic question. I have no idea. I've never been asked that question before. That's a great question. Why don't you have a double invasion then, you know, from the, from the stream back into the lake? Oh, it's brilliant. I don't know. I, I, hope, you, I hope we can talk about it at length over, over uh, beers. That's, yeah, I have no idea. That's great. Good one. Maybe that's where the benthic limnetic pairs came from. She. Um, well, I don't know for sure. What I can tell you is that we're very interested in these population dynamic consequences. And so what I showed you there uh, was just a hint of the beginning of what we're hoping to do with that. I mean, the basic question is there's lots of gene flow and it's constraining the traits for us, but does that have any consequence for the populations? And so there's a bunch of things that would affect that and, and we're just starting to investigate that. So that's, that's all I know at this point. Okay, one last question, please. So this is not related to uh, uh, um, Please, Rufus, do you have any idea what kind of annual uh, pattern goes on in terms of, like, do they experience spades or perhaps some of these river uh, environments sort of destroyed? So, so you're talking about seasonal variation? Yeah, so is it possible that some of the rivers we don't see so much diversity, perhaps because they undergo these kind of cleansing events, which are removing the population and they're really from our own population. Nearby fish are less adapted to Yeah, I, I don't know uh, the answer for that. But I do know why some of those systems don't show much divergent selection. And it's because the lake is often rather small and the stream is often rather lake-like. You know, it's like big ponds and stuff like that that still have zooplankton in them. So that's why sometimes you actually have as much or more zooplankton feeding in the stream as you do in the lake because it's a big beaver pond with very slow flow, for example. So that's, all, that's the only part I do know. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just saying that we were